Uh, thank you for having me today. Uh, it was a wonderful, wonderful introduction to the service and also hopefully to this brief talk. Um, we are just after the two days after the anniversary of the bombing of Hiroshima, August 6th, and one day before the bombing of Nagasaki uh, 76 years ago. Tomorrow will be that anniversary, August 9th. So it's a time to reflect on the bombings that took place, on how they took place, and how we need to conceive them, and most important, how we act going forward. Uh, so I'm going to dig just a bit into the details of that era, because most people don't quite realize um, how decisions are actually made unless there's citizen action uh, to constrain or push forward in a different way. Um, uh, for my sins, I have worked at the various levels of the United States government, including the high levels in the State Department uh, and in the US Senate and in the uh, House of Representatives. So I've had a chance to participate and also to view up close uh, how, how leaders make decisions in the absence or with the permission of the citizens who act. And I want to underline that. Um, my intention today is not simply to tell a historical story nor an analytic story about nuclear weapons and their dangers, but also to raise the question as so often UU groups have raised the question of what then can we do now ourselves, uh, speaking to the person sitting in your chair, my chair, uh, directly rather than as a general uh, thing. So let's go back now to 76 years ago and the, the bombing of Hiroshima and then shortly Nagasaki, just to examine it a little bit with that set of questions in mind, not simply the historical reality. But the historical reality is important because it illuminates that which we need to understand. Uh, I have had the, the benefit of working as a high levels in both the State Department and the US Senate and House, as I mentioned. So I've seen a bit of it up close, but most people don't have that opportunity. So that's what I want to open to you. The first thing to, to recognize is that um, virtually all of the United States military leaders of the time, and this is critical given how public opinion has been shaped since the time of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, virtually all of the top military leaders of that time, think about that, have declared, declared subsequently that the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki were totally unnecessary from a, hum, from a military point of view. The war was essentially over. We had broken the Japanese code and everyone knew it. The Japanese were suing for surrender. There was not going to be an invasion of Japan, but there was a great deal of effort. As one of my books, I looked at the effort to convince the American public after the war over two years span that was absolutely necessary. But within the White House and within the Pentagon and within the State Department, they understood the war was over, the Japanese codes had been broken, they were suing for peace essentially, and that there was a different set of questions in mind. And this conundrum, what happens at the top levels, and as I said, I've seen it from the inside as well as the outside, really raises the question of can things be changed unless there is real citizen action, which is why I'm so happy to speak with a UU group today. Uh, my daughter's very active in UU as well as in Ann Arbor, and people actually choose to act rather than simply to think about it. Nonetheless, it's important to understand the inside story. The first point, the, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff at that time, also Chief of Staff to the President, two roles of the highest level, Chief of Staff to the President, and Chief of Staff, Chief of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral William D. Leahy, a very, very conservative man, indeed, extremely conservative. Here's what he said in his memoirs about, about Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The use, I'm quoting, the use of this barbarous weapon at Hiroshima and Nagasaki was of no material assistance in our war against Japan. The Japanese were already defeated and ready to su surrender. Quote, in being the first to use it, we, we adopted an ethical standard common to the barbarians of the Dark Ages. I was not taught to make war in that fashion. 
Wars cannot be won by destroying women and children. And it's an important point to understand that at this point in the war, virtually all the young men were off in Japan, were off to war. Who was left behind? Women, children, and the elderly. Those are the people who were sacrificed at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Again, the commanding general of the US Army Air Force at that time, very conservative man, Henry H. Hap Arnold, Here's what he said publicly within two weeks after the bombing to the New York Times. Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the Japanese position was hopeless even before the first atomic bomb fell because the Japanese had lost control of their own air. Arnold's view was when, when the question came up of whether it was necessary to use the atomic bomb or not, my view is that the Air Force will not oppose the use of the bomb, they will deliver it if the commander in chief decides but it is not necessary to use it in order to conquer the Japanese without a land invasion. Joint Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, very conservative. And one final conservative, many of you know the name, Curtis LeMay, this famous hawk, was asked by the New York Times. He said, I had, it had not, quote, the atomic bomb had nothing to do with the end of the war. The Russians were already come in and the war was over and would have been over within a couple of weeks. So that's something most people don't aren't aware of, that the decision to use these terrible weapons against Japanese cities, and remember the cities are primarily now in Japan, since all the young men who could do anything were off at war, who's left behind? Women, children, and the elderly. That's, that's, those are the people who were sacrificed at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And the moral implications of that are extreme, uh, given what we now know and, and given what we can reflect on. The dangers now, of course, are much greater. With nuclear weapons proliferated all over the world. And with the control of these weapons within the hands of very small numbers of people, I think met most of our leadership, including the current leadership, is very responsible. But things can get out of hand. Uh, I'm not, not convinced the Russian leadership is responsible. Or if they are, things can get out of hand. Uh, Khrushchev worked with our leadership during the Bay of Pigs to try to prevent the nuclear war. But things happen over time and random events, given the huge number of nuclear weapons, the only way in my experience to constrain and protect is for citizens to take this, these questions in hand. So briefly, let me give you just a bit about what was going on and why it got out of hand and why the bombs were used. And they had very little to do with the military situation. Uh, as I said, many studies have shown that, including military studies by the US uh, military intelligence people, all of which is now available in the archives. The war had come to an end in, in Europe in May 8th, 1945, the surrender of Germany. The bombs were used on August 6th and August 9th in Japan. In that short period, what was going on? President Truman had come into office and there was contention over the diplomatic issues left after the war in Europe with the Soviet Union. How would we structure the post-war world in that period after World War II? And at that point, and it's, there's much documentation, the notion by the leadership was we had to build up a strong world economy that was necessary. The depression had created Hitler, uh, the dangers of the future were could only be solved if we dealt with the world economy. Consider that, the world economy, not the war against Japan. And laying the groundwork in Europe was all about the Potsdam Conference when Truman and Stalin and Churchill met at the end of World War II, July 6th. July 16th, the conference began, 1945. Why did it begin on July 16th, 1945? Question historians have asked, could have been any time, Germany surrendered on May 8th, three months later. Well, it began there for a specific reason. The first atomic test was scheduled for July 16th to see if the weapon actually worked. And at that time, it was postponed several times when the, because the test was postponed to meet with Stalin and Churchill, and Truman meeting with Stalin and Churchill. As the president said at that point privately, if it works as I think it will, Ms. Holmes is that direct quote, 
I'll certainly have a hammer on those boys. He was not referring to the Japanese and he was not referring to the Russians, uh, to the Germans. He was referring to the Soviet Union. And there were two questions involved at that point in time at the White House. One was the future of Europe. How would you control Germany? Who would divide? The Red Army was in the middle of Germany. How would you restore the German and European economy on the theory that the Great Depression had created dictators, dictators create war. The United States has a responsibility to prevent new depressions and the rise of dictators. And that's what the Potsdam Conference of that time was about. That was central. Truman said, if it works as I think it will, as I said, I will have a hammer on those boys, meaning the Russians, about all of these diplomatic issues, not about the war in Germany, which is over, and also not about the war in Japan. And the reason we now know that is that we had, of course, broken the Japanese codes, knew exactly what was happening between their various embassies, particularly the embassy in Moscow. We were watching the code back and forth and it all declared essentially they were begging the Russians to mediate a solution because they, they knew they were badly defeated. Every, so many cities had been bombed, so many people had been killed, their arsenals were depleted, they were on the way out. And we knew this from the codes that we had broken. What happened then? One question in Truman's mind and his advisors, particularly Secretary of State James Burns, was that the bomb would give us, as I said, a hammer on those boys, meaning the Russians, in the settlement over Europe and what to do about Europe and who would control what pieces of Europe and how much. The other piece was, how do you prevent, and again, well-documented now, how do you prevent the Russians from coming in to jointly occupy Japan at the end of the war? How could you prevent that from, a point, from the point of view of diplomacy? Now remember, we had been begging the Russians to come into the war in Japan before the atomic bomb was tested. Because we knew, intelligence said, and I'm almost a direct quote from internal studies, when the Russians enter the war in the Far East, in Manchuria, the, Rus the Japanese will collapse because they know they can't face us and the Russians at once and they will beg for peace. This is just before the bomb was, they were scheduled to enter the war on August 8th, 1945, exactly, exactly this date in 1945. And the atomic bomb was dropped on August 9th, 45. That's not a coincidence. At the, the other political view that the American leaders have in mind was we, if we can prevent the Russians from getting very far into Manchuria and certainly prevent them from getting into Japan, although we had requested that they come in before the bomb was tested because we needed their help in the war. If we can now, with the bomb, keep them out, we can control the situation in the Far East, maybe Manchuria, but certainly in Japan. Again, well-documented, including in, the, in Truman's memoirs, what was going on internally. That had nothing to do with saving lives. It was all about how, who would dominate the post-war world and how that would be developed. And let me stand back from that. I do not regard the people involved as evil people. They were working in, these are, men, these are people, including Truman, who I, who I disagreed with entirely. And I think the record shows that it was unnecessary to use the bomb, totally unnecessary. Also understood at the highest level that it, it was unnecessary because they'd broken the codes and knew the Japanese were begging for peace trying to get the Russians to mediate it. All that's well established. But what they had in mind, American leaders, and this is the real danger that we have to think about with nuclear weapons and why citizen action is so important. These are people who had lived through two world wars, Truman himself, World War I, World War II, a Great Depression, and they didn't want a third world war. And in the best light you can place on these folks, is that they were trying as best they could to establish a world order that would be stable and prevent another world war. And that's how they thought about it. And I can, it's well documented, but that's the basic position. So taking a sympathetic view of what they were trying to do, they didn't want the Russians to jimmy up what was going on in Europe to produce a, a weak Germany economically, which if it were weak economically, 
that would undermine the European economy, there might be Great Depression. These are their theories. Well, in the paper, the papers and policy papers. In the Far East, the same. They didn't want the Russians, although we've been begging them to come in before the bomb was tested. And although they were scheduled to come in three months, figure the dates again, I want to remind you, they were scheduled to come in three months after the defeat of Germany. The defeat of Germany was August, was May 8th. The bombs were dropped on August 9th. Three months and one day past the time they were supposed to come in. And why they, they didn't want the Russians there and they wanted to control and dominate the world political economic situation for the best of reasons, to prevent the depression, to prevent the rise of dictators, et cetera, et cetera. This is the theoretical and moral frame they were operating with. So at the same time, we recognize the importance and dangers of what happened there and the loss of, of, mit, of thousands and thousands and of lives, 200,000, 300, the numbers are very hard to pin down in, your, in both Nagasaki and Hiroshima, but all entirely, virtually, elderly women and, ch and women and children, because all the young men, or most of the young men were away at war. In the interest of preserving a long, what they call the durable peace, a sustainable peace, that's the context that the bombs were used. So standing back from that, the question arises, how do we look at the future now with so many thousand nuclear weapons everywhere and with almost no attention now to the dangers of nuclear war going forward? So I think the issues that are raised by the Hiroshima bombing and the Nagasaki bombing, in, which is 75, 76 years ago, they're even more pressing today because so, many, so few people are now thinking about this. They are out of sight, out of mind. And yet the dangers, I think, of some, we just had a president who I would not myself want to have his hand on the, on the atomic bomb, just voted out of office about a year and a half, a little over, over a year ago. The possibilities of presidents coming in who have different views about nuclear weapons is great in any country. So what this brings us back to is not only the moral costs of the war and the destruction of up to 200,000 lives, depending upon the numbers in Hiroshima, and another 90,000 in Nagasaki. The moral question is, how do we prevent the ongoing continued maintenance of nuclear weapons, thermonuclear weapons? How do we begin using the energies that history and activism can give us for the future to begin re renew the proposals for disarmament and nuclear, uh, to stop nuclear proliferation? How do the lessons of Hiroshima res resonate today and the dangers of small groups controlling one person? Think of it, one person today has the power literally to destroy most of the world. That's unprecedented in, in world history. One person can destroy the world or most of the civilized world or most of the world, depending on how the nuclear weapons are used. My own view of this is it's time for a renewed activism, a renewed discourse, renewed study to begin seriously getting at the question of nuclear weapons, put it back on the stage for public activity. How do religious groups or how do the church groups, how do activist groups take to heart the lessons of Hiroshima and Nagasaki? How do we open this question, which is almost out of, the, out of discussion, out of mind, and yet one man here one man in Tokyo, one man in Beijing, or one woman someday, have their, have their hands on the capacity literally to destroy most of the world. So I leave you with that set of questions that the nuclear, the anniversaries of Hiroshima and Nagasaki are not about the past at all. They are time to reflect each and one of us about the future. And, and then most importantly, not what can be done in the abstract, but what can be done by each of us personally in the context in which we live and act our lives. Thank you very much.